Here they are. The best of what our little island has to offer. Hi, welcome, come on in. My name is Aoife and today I am taking you through all of the great Irish books that I read in 2022. These are my favourite books by Irish authors that I had read over the previous 12 months. Most of them that I had read in March. In March, all of my reading is by Irish authors. I turn so much to that little island that I call home. But there were a few of these that I read outside of March. I read a couple of them in October because they were thrillers. I read a couple of them in maybe February because they had just come out and I could not wait any longer. Let's actually get started with the one that I read in February. And I think hands down, this is my favorite Irish book of the entire year. And that would be, again, Rachel by Marion Keys. This is a follow-up to Rachel's Holiday, which came out in 1997. And now you are following Rachel, the titular character, again, as she is kind of living a very clean life, the complete opposite to how we would have seen her in Rachel's Holiday. Back then, she was living very high octane. She had drug abuse problems. She had alcohol abuse problems. Now she is completely living clean. She is actually a therapist in the rehab center that she went to back in Rachel's Holiday. And I really love seeing that kind of 180 in Rachel's life. I really loved seeing how she is coping at the moment, how life is going for her, all of the ups and downs that she has in life, because that happens no matter what you're going through. However, somebody from her past, somebody from way back then is about to come back into the picture and possibly throw everything that Rachel has worked for completely asunder. I really liked how this was dealt with. It was a character that I loved back when I was reading Rachel's Holiday. And I think that I liked seeing them back together, but as it perspired at the end of the book, I did have to kind of sit with that a little bit. I did have to kind of sit and think, is this the relationship that I want Rachel to be in? Is this the direction that I want her life to go in? And overall, I'm still not sure. I think it was well written and I think it probably should have happened, but I don't know if it's the relationship I would have wanted Rachel to go through. As well as the heavy topics that I've already discovered, such as drug abuse and alcohol abuse, this book also does deal with the breakdown of a marriage, of bereavement, of stillbirth, of miscarriage. Something that, like drug abuse and alcohol abuse, I feel is very personal to Marion and I feel like she has got a lot of personal experience with this, unfortunately. And you can tell that by just how respectfully and how lovingly the storyline is written in this book. It is completely heartbreaking. It is so heartbreaking to see Rachel and Luke wanting a family together, wanting to settle down, wanting to build these roots, and then everything just not working out in the way that they had wanted it to. And this child who was so wanted and cherished and loved, and they never get to spend any time with them. It is a sad reality for so many families around the world. And I really loved the respect, like I said, that this topic was given in this book. It is completely heartbreaking. So it is something to be a little bit aware of when you are going into this book. But if it's something that you can read, if it's something that you are okay with reading, I think this is gonna leave a big bang impact on you. Something else that I really loved about this book is how much of the Walsh family you are still seeing. The family has expanded since we last saw them in The Mystery of Mercy Close. The family has grown. There are new members in there be that new children, new partners. But somebody that I really focused on this book was Kate. Kate is Claire's daughter from Watermelon. She's the first baby that's ever born into the Walsh family. And I would really love to see a Kate book. I'd really love to see what Kate is going through as a person of my age. I'd really love to see what her world is like, how her upbringing has formed her, how much interaction she has with her father, how much she spends with her mother, what she is doing with her life. I'd really love to see a Kate Walsh book. And if Marion happens to be watching this, please let us have what we want. Next up is a book that I really heavily saw myself in, and that is Ashling in the City by Sarah Breen and Edmund McLeisett. Ashling and I seem to have similar things happen to us around the same time. When Ashling lost her job in the second book, I had also lost my job. When Ashley moved city in the fourth book, I had also moved city. So I felt like there was a little bit of a connection before I had even picked up this book. And I think that that is what made me love it a little bit more. But the cities were a little bit different. While I moved to Berlin, Ashling had packed up and moved away to New York, working as an events executive officer for a really big marketing and events firm in the city. I really loved seeing this because there is so much that any immigrant can associate with in this book. There is the kind of culture shock that you have from moving to a different city. The kind of settling in periods that you go through when you are just realizing what goes into which rubbish bin? Where do I need to go to find this? Something that you might think of as second nature becomes completely foreign and unnatural to you 
when you're in different surroundings, when you're using a different language, when you are in a different country. It also does feature quite a heavy Irish immigrant based area and you have got like a lemsip black market of this vitamin C paracetamol drink that Irish people will take if they have got a cold or if they are feeling a little bit run down but it's really difficult to get it in the US or you cannot bring it into the US so anybody who smuggles it in it's almost like a drug lord situation where you meet up in corners of pubs or in alleyways and just hand over packets to each other. I really loved that idea because that is something that my friends and I here do when we go back home. We'll ask each other, is there something I can bring you back from home? Do you want maybe some lemsip, some tea, some cream eggs, something like that. So seeing that was a definite pull in for this book and it was something that just left me with such a huge smile on my face while I was reading this. There was some things I did not agree with in this book and that is the love interest in here. And I don't mean the main one. I mean that Ashling's ex-boyfriend, John, comes back into the fray. And that is not something that I was okay with. I didn't love how this relationship was turning out. I didn't love the ending that we had with the two of them. I felt like it was opening a lot of doors that I didn't want to reopen here. Overall though, I really did enjoy this book. I know that the final book in this series is coming out in autumn of 2023, and I cannot wait to read it but it's going to be such a bittersweet experience. I don't wanna to have to say goodbye to Ashling yet. She's one of my comfort reads. She's one of my favorite characters. She's one of the books that are characters that I see myself in the most. But if I have to say goodbye to her, I really hope that she gets the send off she deserves. Next up is Homestretch by Graham Norton. And I'm gonna say first off the bat that I listened to the audiobook of this. It was narrated by Graham himself and it was phenomenal. Graham has a really great storytelling voice and he really brings the characters, the settings, the situation to life. So if you do want to read this book, I would highly recommend that you pick it up as an audiobook as well. It follows Connor, who is from a very small community in Cork in the south of Ireland. And he is one of six people who is in a car accident in the 1980s. Three of the people in the car lose their lives and three of the people survive the accident and the three who are left behind are almost ostracized by the community. They are almost cast aside. They are seen as kind of the perpetrators. They are seen as the ones who are really responsible for this death, but in particular for Connor, who it is seen as the one that was driving the car. So he is the one that bears the most responsibility in the eyes of the people in the town. Something else that kind of ostracizes Connor is the fact that he is gay. So he also has the whole homophobia that was rife in Ireland in the 1980s to deal with. And this topic is really dealt with so well. You can tell that this is something that Graham has got personal experience with, unfortunately, but it was written in a really realistic way. Ireland back in the 1980s, is nowhere near as tolerant, as welcoming, as open, as accepting as the Ireland that I know and love of 2023. So I feel like this kind of a situation could well have happened. This kind of storyline could well have happened. And it's not just in Ireland that he is experiencing this. Connor also leaves Ireland for Liverpool, which has a really big Irish community in the city. And when Connor gets to Liverpool and people realize that he's gay, he is also subjected to a lot of physical and emotional mental abuse for being gay. It's not really until Connor moves to New York that his life kind of starts to turn around. But then there are a lot of kind of twists and people who come into his life that he had never expected and connections to his small town that he never expected to reopen. I really loved this part of the story. It brings you down a kind of a road that you never think you're going to be brought down on. And I had actually thought that the people that Connor had met in New York, it would have a completely different output. I really thought that they would kind of get to know each other in a different way. But I'm really glad that this is how Graham went with it because I feel like this is another thing that is so common in Ireland, especially with how many families kind of lose touch with a family member who has come out as LGBT, especially with family members who might have moved away, moved country, moved city, and they don't talk as much anymore. They kind of have these big falling outs that nobody ever tries to repair. I felt like that was dealt with really well. I don't want to say I loved reading it because there were parts of it that were quite difficult to kind of sit with. But overall, I felt like it was so well written. It felt like it was really well researched or that there was parts of it that were so personal to Graham that he probably felt like he couldn't leave it off of the page. I really recommend this book. I've got another book of Graham's on my TBR for this month. And if it's any way as good as that one is going to be, I think I'm in for a good time. Next up is a historical fiction book called The Pull of the Stars by Emma Donoghue. This is one of Victoria from what Victoria Red's absolute favourite books of all time. 
So I was going into it with quite high expectations because any book that she has read and loved, I feel like it's going to be a good read. And it was, but it can be a little bit difficult to sit with at times. It's a book that is set during the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, 1919. And reading that during the pandemic that we have at the moment, did hit a little bit too close to home at times. There were times that I felt like this was maybe a little bit too close to the reality I was living through. But something that did kind of take me out of the picture a bit is that the action in this mainly takes place in a maternity hospital in Dublin. Not something that I've ever been in, so I did have that little kind of distance between me and this book. It follows Julia, who is one of the nurses in this hospital, and she is taking care of all of these expectant mothers who are not just bringing new life into the world, but many of whom are also suffering with the Spanish influenza themselves. So as you can expect, quite a few of these mothers don't actually make it. Some of them may have just given birth and then go into shock or their body takes over and they pass away. There are also some instances of the children themselves who don't survive. There is a stillbirth in this book, which is completely heartbreaking, completely harrowing to read. And if that is a topic that is in any way a sensitive topic for you, I would definitely go into that with a little bit of caution because if it can make me cry on the U-Bahn on the way to Alexanderplatz, it will absolutely destroy you. There is also a female-female romance in this book and I kind of thought that that came out of nowhere. I kind of thought that it was sprung on me a little bit. I didn't see it really building up. I didn't really see any kind of hints that this romance would come to fruition in this book. But I am really glad that it was dealt with. I am really glad that it was discussed because I feel like a lot of the time if I'm reading an historical fiction book, all of the romances in there are male-female. I've never really seen a male-male romance. I've never really seen a female-female romance. That's not to say that they don't exist. It's just not something that I have ever personally seen. So I really liked to see that representation in it. Something else as well that I really enjoyed seeing is the advancement in modern medicine compared to the book that I was reading. There are so many things that you are just reading and you think, oh my goodness, I'm so glad that we have got something in place that we can deal with this. I'm so glad that this is not as big of a problem anymore as it would have been back a hundred years ago. It really does make you thankful for all of the medical help that we have in the world, for all of the doctors, nurses, physicians, surgeons, anesthesiologists, everybody who has got any kind of lick of pain to do with medical industry in their title. I'm really thankful for them and I'm sure that after reading this book you will be as well. If you're still not in the mood for a pandemic book, if you're still kind of living a little bit of COVID PTSD, maybe give this one a little bit of a swing for a little bit while longer. But if it is something that you feel like you can deal with, if you can deal with descriptions of childbirth, descriptions of stillbirth, of child loss and of death on the page, definitely recommend that you pick this up. Next up is a book by one of my favourite Irish authors and that is Idol by Louise O'Neill. I read this as a buddy read with Michelle from Michelle's Library and both of us absolutely loved this. This book follows Samantha who is an Instagram influencer and she has just reached 3 million followers on her Instagram page. So to celebrate this, she's written an essay about her first sexual experience with a woman, one of her best friends from back then in high school. Lisa, who was Samantha's best friend at the time, writes to Samantha's agent and tells her that she does not remember this instant in the same way that Samantha does. She doesn't remember it being consensual. It wasn't something that she wanted to happen. And she has regretted that night ever since. What follows is an entire conversation about victim blaming, about whose side are you going to take, about how much of an importance we can put in social media in our lives, about the idea of influencers and about how we kind of tend to look upon them as godlike and indestructible. And there is no way that they can come off of this pillar that we have sent, that we have tended to put them on. I really enjoyed reading that aspect of it. I really enjoyed this kind of discussion of cancel culture, this discussion of how much of an importance we have tended to place on influencers, social media, all that kind of thing. It was really eye-opening to me to see just how much this can impact not only our lives, but their lives and the mentality that they can have that every time the numbers go up, everything is rosy. Every time the numbers come back down, panic mode. Of course, though, it is also a really good discussion of the Me Too period and the Me Too movement that happened quite a lot in the US, but also at this side of the Atlantic. Something that I noticed about this book is that it is set in the US and I kind of understand why Louise had done that. 
But also I do kind of wish that she hadn't said it in the US. I do wish that this was something that had happened on this side of the Atlantic. I wish it was something that she had said in Ireland because in Ireland we didn't have as big of an impact in the Me Too movement as there would have been in the US. So I think to set it in my own shores would have also made a really great impact for me. Something I have to praise Louise for, but also kind of struggled with a little bit, is how Samantha herself was written. It has all of the hallmarks of a Louise O'Neill book in that Samantha is incredibly unlikable as a character. She doesn't really have any redeeming features. She doesn't really have anything that you feel like you want her to succeed in this. You are rooting for her in this instance. And I feel like Louise writes characters like that so well. But also I feel like Samantha's age was really oddly written. Canonically in this book, Samantha is 40 years old, but she actually read to me as somebody who was in their mid to late 20s. I would have said easily that she was maybe 25, 26, because a lot of the language that she uses is very juvenile. A lot of the thoughts that she has are very juvenile. A lot of her impressions of herself can also be quite juvenile. And I wonder if this is because she is so heavily entrenched in influencer culture, in the world of social media, in the world of Instagram, that she never really had that moment to become an adult. She never really had that moment of kind of personal growth and self-growth that a lot of people who are in their 40s will have had. She's not as comfortable with herself as Lisa is. She's not as okay with her own company. She's clearly not as secure as Lisa is as a person. So I feel like that section of it was written quite well, but also there were times that I thought, Samantha reads a lot more like a 25 year old than she does a 40 year old. This is one of my favorite of Louise Newell's book to date and I cannot wait to see where she comes with the next one. But if you are in any way interested in any of the topics that are dealt with in this book, I implore you, go and pick it up. Next up is a non-fiction book called A Ghost in the Throat by Dear Negrifa. This book is a kind of a look back at a woman who has been forgotten by Irish history, but her husband is somebody that we all would have known. In the 1700s, a poem is written for Art Ilera, and this poem is a lament, which is written after his death. But somebody who was very important to his life was his wife, whose name was Eileen Dovey Hunnell. Irish history has completely forgotten about her, but he is all over the place when you are thinking about Irish history. I think his poetry or his lament came up in the Leaving Cert the year that I did my exams, or it frequently comes up in the Leaving Cert Irish syllabus. In the present day, Dear Negri for herself finds herself pregnant with her third child. It is an unexpected pregnancy. When she discovers this woman and her life story and her history when she's going through the annals of the UCC library, she goes off to find out a little bit more about her and discovers a kind of a connection between herself and Eileen Dove that she never really expected to happen. This book deals with the difficult birth that Deirin had for her child and the aftermath of this and how much it has affected her as a parent, as a parent not just to the newborn but also to her other children and her relationship with her husband and her relationship with herself. There are also quite a lot of instances of the Irish language because Deirin herself is a Gaelgor, which is a fluent Irish speaker. And I really loved that kind of connection. I am also a Gaelgor, I'm a fluent Irish speaker, and I don't really get a lot of instances to read it, to write it, to speak it, to experience it. So when I read this book and I noticed that there was quite a lot of the Irish language in here, it was like a little trip home for me, more so than any of the other books that I had read this year had been. It was a really great instance to see all of these poems that I knew about, poems that I had studied in my life, but also to see how else they would have been impacted. Another way that these people were influenced and impacted in their lives. I really implore you to go and pick this book up. It is one of my favorite Irish nonfiction books. Another favorite nonfiction Irish book that had quite a lot of heavily influence from the Irish language was Mother Folklore by Dara Choche. I loved this book. I got this as a gift from my friend Caitlin and she said that no matter where you are in the world, this will always make you think of home. And she was correct. Mother Folklore takes a look at the Irish language, how it is seen as a dying language, what is being done to revive it, but also it takes a look at the semantics of the language itself, the linguistics, the etymology of quite a lot of words, some of the loan words that we have given to English, for example, smithereens or boreen, but also it takes a look at some Irish names, how they are pronounced, how they are seen across the world, and I really loved that because even I found words in this book and even I found names in this book that I had never experienced, that I had never heard before. So I felt like it was such a great learning experience, even for me as a fluent Irish speaker, 
that I feel like even if you are just starting out with the language, it will still give you a little bit of a base. It will still give you an idea of the phonetics, of the spelling, of some of the rules that we have in the language. And I utterly implore you, if you are anyway interested in linguistics, if you would like to start learning the Irish language, definitely go and pick it up. Next up is a YA romance called Hani and Ishu's Guide to Fake Dating by Adiba Jagadar. This is Adiba's second book and it follows the titular Hani and Ishu who are secondary school students and who decide to fake date each other for specific reasons for each other. Ishu is running for student body president, she's running for the class president and she is not as popular as the other people who are running for it. She decides to form a relationship with Hani get her name out there a little bit, get people noticing her a little bit, and hopefully the votes are gonna start coming in. Hani has two great friends, Ashling and Dee, and she has just come out to Ashling and Dee as bisexual, but she has also been completely torn apart by them. They tell her that she is faking it, that she couldn't be bisexual because she's never been with a girl before. Any of the previous people she's kissed has all been male. So there is just no way in hell that Hani could be bisexual. She's just doing it to fit in. She's just doing it to stand out. She's just doing it for the attention, whatever. They completely cast her feelings aside. So Hani thinks that in order to prove her bisexuality, which is dumb by the way, she is going to date Ishu and she is going to show her friends that actually, yes, she does have feelings for women. She does have sexual feelings or romantic feelings for her own gender. And of course, because it is a fake dating book, real feelings start to come into the fray. As well as all of those main plots, you also have got the story of Ishu's sister, Niki, who is living in London at the moment. She's training to be a doctor and she comes back to visit the family with her boyfriend in tow but it turns out that Nikki is actually engaged to be married. This throws the entire family into chaos because it's not the linear thing that her parents had seen for her. They wanted her to study, be a doctor, get a good job, then start thinking about a family, then start thinking about relationships, then start thinking about marriage. And I really enjoyed seeing this whole familial expectations versus reality situation that was brought in. There were quite a few heavy topics brought in, and I think that that is because parents from a Muslim background can be a little bit stricter on their children than those of Irish backgrounds. So there was that whole kind of thing that you had to look and deal with, that whole cultural chasm that is in the country. But I really enjoyed seeing it. I think it was dealt with so well. It was written really well. And I would actually really love to see a Nikki book. I'd love to see what happens when Nikki is living in London. I'd love to see her meeting her partner. I'd love to see their wedding, the build up to the wedding, what happens afterwards. I'd really love to see a book from Nikki's point of view. If Adiba ever feels like writing for a more adult audience, I think that's the one that she should start with. Next up is a thriller by one of my favorite Irish thriller writers, and that is Lying in Way by Liz Nugent. Liz Nugent is one of my favorite Irish authors at the moment, not just as thrillers, but of all time. So I had a really high expectations and I had really high hopes going into this book that I would be completely spellbound by it. And I was. I did not leave my reading chair for about three or four hours. I just wanted to get the book finished. This book is about Lydia, Andrew and Lawrence. Lydia and Andrew are married. Lawrence is their son. And the opening line of this book is one that is probably going to stay with me for the rest of my life. My husband didn't mean to kill Annie Doyle, but the lying tramp had it coming. As you go through the book, you start to realise what the relationship that Annie Doyle had with Lydia and Andrew was, what the impact of Lawrence's influence in this book is. And Lydia is one of my favourite complex characters, but she is also such a wholly unlikable person. I feel like there was absolutely nothing of redeemable quality of her. Every time he saw her on the page, she was manipulative. She was controlling. She was never in any way sorry for any of the actions that she had done or the things that she had caused. And the ending of this book, Liz writes such great endings that she will bring you down a path and you think you know where she's going. And then she will spin you around maybe 20 times and take you a whole other way that you had never thought you would be in. I am obsessed with with Liz Nugent. She's also a very atmospheric author. I always felt like I was standing in the middle of their mansion in Dublin, or when Lawrence and his partner had gone away to Rome for a holiday, I felt like I was standing on the steps of the Trevi Fountain with him, answering a phone call from his mother, or 
eating the pasta that he was eating. She's such an atmospheric author and she really does drop you into the pages of the book that you are reading. I'm reading one of her books at the moment. I have got one more book of hers that I want to read before I've got her finished. And I am so captivated by the stories that she tells, the story weaving that she does. And her characters are so complex and her stories are so complex themselves that you cannot help but be spellbound by her writing. Last up is a kind of an honourable mention because I'm not actually sure that this person is an Irish author, but they have an Irish passport. So I think that that kind of counts. This is The Guest List by Lucy Foley. And I'm not saying that one of the main reasons I love this book is that there is a character called Aoife in it. But one of the main reasons I love this book is because there's a character called Aoife in it. This book is set on a fictional island off the coast of Galway and it is set across a weekend where a wedding is being held between Will and Jules. And you're not only seeing the influence of this wedding on Will and Jules themselves, but also their family members, their wedding party, the wedding planner, the wedding coordinator. And there is so much fallout from this book. There are so many kind of twists and turns and new things that you experience as you're going through the book. I was captivated by this. I had heard a couple of things going into this book that I was a little bit apprehensive about it. I'd heard that it was quite a difficult read. I've heard that it was quite slow paced. I've heard a lot of people didn't love it, but I never really had that experience. I had such a good time with this book. I found it really fast paced. I found it really interesting, really intriguing. And I just had a really good time with it. I've also got a couple of Lucy's other books on my TBR. I got a copy of The Haunting Party from my aunt who was doing a clear out at Christmas. I've also got a copy of The Paris Apartment on my shelf down there. And now that I know that I really enjoy Lucy's writing, now that I know how great of a twist she can write at the end, now that I know how great of a writer she is in terms of completely hoodwinking you and blindfolding you and thinking that you are on the right track, I cannot wait to pick up those two. Those were my favourite books that I read by Irish authors in 2022. What was your favourite book that you read by an Irish author last year? If you'd like to leave me a comment but you can't think of anything you'd like to say, then just leave me the green book emoji. Don't forget to like and subscribe because I have new videos up every week. Now, get on out of here. <laughs>